Well, good morning, morning. and welcome to the midweek service on this somewhat sunny day. It was beautiful when I drove in this morning, but it seems like the clouds have gathered. Mansell spoke last week on wisdom. Um, I didn't know what Mansell was speaking on, and I was in the process of writing a sermon on wisdom. (laughs) So this morning, this dovetails neatly, I hope, um, with what we heard last week for those of us who are here. So we just begin the service with a moment of prayer. Just to still our minds and our hearts. And to acknowledge, Lord, that you are here with us in this place, in the silence. Lord, in this holy place, at this holy time, we, your people made holy, acknowledge your lordship over your world, over your church, and over our lives. Lord, we are yours. We come in homage, we come in wonder, And we come in trust, trusting that the presence of your life-giving spirit will transform our act of worship into an offering worthy of you, our Lord of Lords. Amen. We're going to sing together our first hymn, um, a slightly quieter one to start, Be Still for the Presence of the Lord. in a moment. Um, Some of you may be aware, this week is Mental Health Awareness Week. For some of us that may mean a great deal, for some of us that may mean not very much at all. 
We're just going to take some time to pray, to praise God, and to pray for those for whom this week means more than perhaps for others. So shall we pray together? Loving God, great in love, wisdom, and might. Majestic without compare, we worship you. You are the creator, flinging stars into space, bringing the light of life to the darkness of barren waste. God of compassion, comforter of wounded souls, meeting pain with peace and woe with joy. Turning pride and power upside down and lifting humble hearts high, we worship you. You are our redeemer, bringing the promise of forgiveness to the despair of guilt. God of liberation, lifting lives crushed by circumstance, filling hearts fearful of worth, raising hopes dashed by sorrow. We worship you. You are the inspirer urging pilgrims on to find the way and the truth and the life for all their days. God, our healer. We pray for healing and for health this week of all weeks. For all who suffer in this world with minds that cannot bear its strains, with bodies that ache, that feel pain. Restoring God, we look to you. We know that you are with us. Lord, let us feel your presence with us this morning. And let each of those with minds struggling to bear the weight of life. Be with them and be to them what they need today. In Jesus' name, Amen. Now, I mentioned at the start that Mansell spoke on wisdom last week and I'm going to do something similar this week. So I've got two readings for us this morning. The first is from Mark chapter 12. I imagine a familiar one. One of the teachers of the law came and heard them debating. Noticing that Jesus had given them a good answer, he asked him, of all the commandments, which is the most important? The most important one, answered Jesus, is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this. Love your neighbour as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. Well said, teacher, the man replied. You are right in saying that God is one and there is no other but him. To love him with all your heart, with all your understanding and with all your strength and to love your neighbour as yourself is more important than all burnt offerings and sacrifices. When Jesus saw that he had answered wisely, he said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. And from then on, no one dared ask him any more questions. And our second reading this morning is one that Mansell touched on in his sermon. 
It's James 3, verses 13 to 18. Who is wise and understanding among you? Let them show it by their good life, by deeds done in the humility that comes from wisdom. But if you harbour bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about it or deny the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from heaven, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you find disorder and every evil practice. But the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. Peacemakers who sow in peace reap a harvest of righteousness. Now last week Mansell reminded us of the words of Solomon, who asked God for a discerning heart. And he reminded us of Paul's letter to the church at Corinth about earthly wisdom and heavenly wisdom. And he read from James some of the definition that we just heard. And I'd like to just explore a single question this morning. What does it mean to be wise as Christians? What does it mean to be wise? Now, I want to be clear up front that I'm not here to tell you what wisdom is, to neatly and clearly define it for you, to show you exactly how to attain it, because I don't think that's how wisdom works. But I think you probably know that already. And actually, I'm not convinced it's something we ever have. That's an ownership word that doesn't really make sense here because wisdom is higher and deeper and wider and longer than we can ever fully conceive. It leads us toward God and it is of God. So to tell you about wisdom, to define it for you, to give you the shape of it, the full outline, I can't do that. But I can share some of what I've learned so far, my own learnings, my own reflections, and weave that in with what I think I hear in James. So that's what I'm gonna do for us this morning. Now, what we heard there is wisdom is not as simple as knowing what is right and what is wrong. What we should or shouldn't do, should or shouldn't say. Now, don't get me wrong, those things have their place and they are, of course, important, but it's what they bloom out of and what they're rooted in that I think matters the most. So perhaps it's easier to think about wisdom in human terms as a posture or an intention or a way of being. Wisdom then is about who we are, not just what we do or don't do. Those things are important, but they're just hints, outworkings of something much bigger going on inside us. Wisdom is that very thing we're seeking after, that thing that takes root inside of us, shaping us and transforming us as we seek after God. So I wonder whether wisdom is a lifelong journey of seeking. One in which we acknowledge that we live in that messy place where the wisdom of the world meets the wisdom of heaven. And that's what we hear in James 3. Now, James is often overlooked, and I think that's easily done because it's a small book, it's just five chapters. And it's also easy to get caught up in questions of faith and works, which James brings up, of believing and behaving and what's more important. But I think maybe that distracts us from the underlying message in James, which is one of wisdom. Now, you might be really familiar with James, but I find it's always helpful to set the scene. Now, James is a small and a mighty book, I think, written not for a specific community, but for all those Christians living outside of Jerusalem, scattered. 
And it reads as a challenge and a way through for those living in the midst of the messiness of life. And so it's a sermon for its readers. And it brings to life for them what it means to live according to God's law, according to Torah, what it means to be wise. And James recognises that it's Jesus that's shown that in its richest and its purest form. And the heart of what Jesus tells us about living wisely is summed up for us in the reading we heard from Mark's Gospel. And James is pointing us back to this, naming the reality of what it so often means to be human. To harbour envy and ambition, among other things, and the disorder that that creates in our lives. And as he does that, he points us forward to the goodness of God's way. Without God, our lives are upside down. And James points to how Jesus plays around with that to show us what things look like when they're the right way up, when they're as God desires. The wisdom James points us toward turns upside down the traditional ideas of what is wise, because that's exactly what Jesus did. So in James then, what we see isn't an instruction manual for what we must do in order to get wisdom, to have wisdom, to be wise, do this, don't do that. It's not even a map with a clear path laid out for us to follow. It's deeper and richer and, I think, more exciting than that. It's a treasure hunt. James is scattering breadcrumbs for us on the path to wisdom. James gives us snippets of what it means to be on the journey with God. And he leaves us with some pithy one-liners to set us off and running to carry with us as we go. James gives us glimpses of the way of transformation, the way of wisdom, of God's way. So where does this way of wisdom lead us? It might be helpful to reflect for a moment on another word, perfection. For James, those two ideas go together and they run as strands interwoven through his book. To be perfect is to be like Christ, and that's what we seek after. But perfection these days is a loaded term. It's a term that comes with baggage. It's the weight of trying to achieve the impossible and goes hand in hand with the dread and inevitability of failure. But that's not what it is here. Perfection here, I think, is about wholeness, completeness, about a life lived consistently. That's perfection, I think. What James does throughout his letters and what we hear in the reading is contrast behaviours. That's what we heard. He tells us that the same tongue that praises God goes on to speak badly of others. James reminds us that everything is holy ground. Everything is of God. At church, at home, at work, at the shops, at school. And there is no distinction to be made. That same tongue speaks in holy places wherever it goes. Now I said at the start that perhaps wisdom is a way of being, an intention or a posture. And I think that's what James is showing us here. It's about seeking to live consistently, a whole life lived for God. Nothing hidden and nothing kept back. It's about recognising God in all things, in every area of our lives, the big and the small. And seeking to love God and our neighbour in and through each of those. It can feel thoroughly overwhelming to seek after that. And I feel that. But it's not something we do on our own. It's about God taking us as fractured people and making us whole. Giving us new perspective so that we see the world, the people around us, through God's own eyes. And to glimpse God is to glimpse the way of wisdom. What matters then 
is how our lives are slowly but surely illuminated by it. I said earlier that wisdom, wisdom isn't something we accrue or store up. It's not something we claim and own, that that's the wrong language. Because wisdom is selfless. It seeks out God. It seeks to love God and then to love others, partly as a way of loving God. And love is a verb. It's a doing word, not a having word. Indeed, in verse 13, James writes, let them show it by their good life. Wisdom is hard work and hard one. The wisdom of heaven is not something we attain and then stop pursuing. It's the lifelong pursuit of God's very heart. And it's not something we forego other activities to do in the peace and the quiet. It might be, but that is not the only way. It's what we learn by doing, by being in the middle of the messiness of life. We learn by doing, and by doing and learning, we become little by little more of what we were created to be in Christ. Wisdom shapes our very being, changes who we are, and as we grow with God, then we grow in wisdom. It's circular. As we seek, as we do, we grow, are transformed. And so again, we seek, we do, and the circle goes on. That is the work of a lifetime. That is the work of wisdom. Now I'd like to share with you this morning a little about Therese of Lisieux. Some of you may know who she is. She may be new for others. Now, there was nothing particularly remarkable or extraordinary about Therese. She was a nun living in 19th century France. She lived her whole life hidden away in a convent. And her writing was only discovered after she passed away at age 24. And it has become so moving and so profound for those people that have discovered it, precisely because it is so simple. What Therese had stumbled on was the little way, a breadcrumb on the path to wisdom that she scattered and millions have since followed. Now, the little way is about doing both small and big things with great love. As well as focusing on those large actions, we bring God into the smallest ones. It's not about doing extraordinary things, it's about being extraordinary in the ordinary, in the everyday of our lives. Now Saint Therese wrote about how much care she put into folding napkins at each mealtime and she served the sisters in the convent and she says she completed the task or at least attempted to with as much love and attention as if Jesus himself was coming to dine with her as if Jesus himself was coming to dine with her Therese had learned that God is in all things that every place is a holy place, a place to seek after God. And the little way, Therese's way, is there for each of us. All the things in our life, big and small, become avenues to God. Places for wisdom. On a practical level, we shouldn't leave out those small things done with great love. The little way puts our journey of faith into God's hands again and again in the small, quiet things of life. Whether we're folding napkins or training for ministry, everything is done with extraordinary love. 
This, I think, is a glimpse of what God's wisdom looks like at work in our lives. I will never be wise. That is all done, arrived at, finished. It's a lifelong process. God's wise, and I just seek after that. I just seek after glimpses of it, to look at life through God's binoculars for a while until I tire or I fall. It's not something I do on my own, it's what I do with God. And it's what comes out of our relationship with God. So perhaps the most appropriate way of putting it then is that we are all on the way to wisdom, each of us. And that it's something we do together in this community, in the communities of which we are each a part. James wasn't writing to a single person. He was writing to groups scattered but united in different places. We are all of us on the way of wisdom, seeking after God. And while we grow in understanding, it remains always just beyond our grasp. And perhaps that's what makes it so beautiful. That's the lifelong journey of faith right there, of reaching for more and more of God, of loving God by loving others and doing so being transformed. James then, he just signposts us towards that, scatters those breadcrumbs by which we navigate, starts us on our way to wisdom, just like Therese, but it is just the start of doing and of learning and of being transformed. As James says, may we all be peacemakers who sow in peace and reap a harvest of righteousness. Shall we pray together? O oh Lord, may all we say and do reflect the faith we have in you. For faith is meant to change the way we live our lives from day to day. God, may we open wide the door and welcome people who are poor and may we share with them our bread. For faith without good works is dead. Just as a spark can start a fire our words can damage or inspire. We pray for wisdom from above to speak and act in gentle love. May we not covet earthly things or seek the riches this world brings. May we not boast of all our plans, for Lord, our lives are in your hands. O oh Lord, possessions rust away but your love fills us every day. Through prayer and service in your name, may we live out the faith we claim. Lord, as we seek after you, as we seek to live lives that reflect something of you, something of your wisdom. We ask that you be at the center of that this morning. That it would inspire us in the big and the great and the visible and the small and the quiet and the hidden things of our lives, that all would be done with great love. Amen. We're going to sing together now our final hymn, and Take My Life and Let It Be.
Shall we close by saying the grace together? The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen.